government shutdown is when departments or agencies of the federal government no longer have an approved budget from Congress and they have to shut down all activities or programs that are not essential to either national security or to the protection of human lives and property. And this normally occurs when a full year spending bill or what we call a stopgap continuing resolution is not in place uh, by the time the agency or department or program's authority to spend taxpayer dollars expires. So during a shutdown, some programs and activities and departments actually remain open and, and some close. Some of the ones that remain open, Social Security benefits, Medicare and Medicaid, two of our most important health programs, they generally continue to operate during a shutdown. That's because they have authority to spend taxpayer dollars from Congress that doesn't expire. Uh, we call that mandatory spending and it's about seven in every $10 spent by the government. However, the other three in $10, it's what we call discretionary spending. And we call it that because Congress has to approve an annual budget for that kind of spending every single year. And that includes several important priorities of government, such as the nation's military, the maintenance of national parks, food safety inspections, taxpayer assistance at the IRS. There are all sorts of categories of spending in this um, discretionary category, and they are at risk of a shutdown when Congress hasn't approved their budget in time. All sorts of Americans are affected by a government shutdown. Very important government services, uh, such as taxpayer assistance at the IRS, many veterans benefits, and programs that specifically support low-income women and children. It also affects a lot of employees of the federal government across the country. A shutdown can lead to hundreds of thousands of workers uh, being furloughed and missing paychecks. It can lead to hundreds of thousands of more uh, government workers having to work uh, without even receiving a paycheck, at least until the shutdown ends. And lastly, a government shutdown impacts uh, thousands of small businesses across the country. Small businesses applying to the Federal Small Business Administration for loans and grants, and small businesses providing goods and services to the federal government as contractors. Well, we know from the 2018-2019 shutdown that lasted 34 days, cost the U.S. economy $11 billion. It was $11 billion in loss, gross domestic product, or GDP. And while the U.S. economy earned some of that lost productivity and economic activity back, $3 billion of that $11 billion was permanently lost. It was permanently uh, lost economic activity. Government shutdowns affect both demand and supply in the economy. The federal government is one of the largest purchasers of goods and services in the entire world. And so when they stop making purchases of goods and services, it has ripple effects throughout the economy. Shutdowns also impact supply, specifically the supply of workers in the economy. When hundreds of thousands of government workers are put on furlough, it's uh, making the economy less productive. Both the U.S. Constitution and a 19th century law called the Anti-Deficiency Act basically state that federal departments and agencies and programs can't spend money without congressional authority to do so and without funding that's appropriated by Congress. As for the political reasons, every shutdown has unique political causes behind it, but at the core of each shutdown is a fundamental disagreement between Republicans and Democrats in Congress over government spending levels. Uh, Congress has a defined budget process in law and it generally requires them to get their work done months ahead of time so that we don't have problems like government shutdowns. But unfortunately, the, the congressional budget process is, is broken and it needs fixing. Over the past 40 years, we've gotten a budget done on time about 10% of the time and we've been late uh, the other 90% of the time. Clearly, something isn't working and the Bipartisan Policy Center is working with members of Congress and experts in both parties to try and improve the budget process and to make it more predictable and efficient. Good day and welcome. I'm Michelle Stockwell, President of Bipartisan Policy Center Action. Thank you for joining us today as we find ourselves 10 days out from a potential government shutdown. To avoid it, Congress must either pass a full year of spending bills or stopgap continuing resolution to keep the government open before midnight, September 30th. If the government shut down, it would be the 15th time since 1980 and the first since the 2018-2019 shutdown that lasted 34 days, the longest shutdown in history. We know from these past shutdowns that they hurt America and Amer Americans and the economy. Members of the military may stop receiving paychecks, 
everything from veterans benefits to farm loans to small business support can be interrupted or totally grind to a halt. And weeks long shutdown can result in billions of dollars lost into the economy. It's important that lawmakers work in a bipartisan, bicameral fashion to prevent government shutdowns now and in the future. The best way to do so is to pass spending bills on time. Unfortunately, that doesn't usually happen. So today, we'll hear from a pair of bipartisan lawmakers proposing a different solution to make shutdowns a thing of the past. Senators Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire and James Langford of Oklahoma. BBC Action is pleased to be a strong supporter of their effort. Unfortunately, Senator Hassan couldn't join us today, but has provided remarks to share before I turn it over to Bloomberg government's Jack Fitzpatrick, who will moderate a discussion with Senator Langford and then with former OMB officials, Michael Linden and Margaret Weikert. Hi, I'm Senator Maggie Hassan. I'm sorry that I can't join you in person today, but I am grateful for the Bipartisan Policy Center's important efforts and thankful for your work aimed at preventing government shutdowns. The Bipartisan Policy Center helps bring people together to address the most urgent challenges facing our country. I'm grateful for everything that you do to help advance common sense solutions in order to build a better future for all Americans. The risk of a government shutdown reminds us that bipartisan leadership is more important now than ever, and we need to work together to avoid a government shutdown now and in the years to come. Shutdowns are costly, avoidable, and directly harm the American people. They jeopardize our economy, our national security, and our standing as a country. That's why Senator Langford and I have introduced the Bipartisan Prevent Government Shutdowns Act. This law would not only prevent a shutdown this year, but would end the risk of government shutdowns entirely going forward. I want to thank Senator Langford for his leadership on this issue, and I hope that everyone here continues to advocate for ending the threat of government shutdowns and continues encouraging a constructive and bipartisan approach to running the world's greatest democracy. Thank you again to the Bipartisan Policy Center and everyone gathered here today. Thank you, Senator Hassan, for your remarks and for sharing the importance of preventing government shutdowns. As an Okie born and raised, I am pleased to introduce our next guest. Senator James Langford is currently serving in his second full term as Senator from Oklahoma and previously served two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. He is a member of the Senate Committees on Intelligence, Finance, and Homeland Security and Government Affairs, where he serves as the ranking member of the Government Operations and Border Management Subcommittee. Joining him to moderate a fireside chat is, on his current efforts to end government shutdowns is Jack Fitzpatrick, who covers Congress for Bloomberg government, focusing on budget and appropriations process. Previously, he covered energy and environmental policy for morning consult and house campaigns for National Journal's hotline. Thank you both for being here today. Jack, over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm really excited to be here to moderate this discussion with Senator Langford. Uh, it is a bit of an unfortunately uh, relevant time to talk about shutdowns, so I'll, I'll get right to it. Senator, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, given that we've got 10, 10 days left until uh, the deadline to fund the government. I have to start with the most obvious question at hand. Do you expect a, a shutdown on October 1st? I, I don't expect it, but it's always a possibility at this point. There's a lot of things that can be done in the next 10 days to be able to avoid that. And I hope we take one of those off ramps on it. Uh, but it is one of those things that just hangs over our economy. And quite frankly, everyone who's a federal worker, their family, it just hangs over them right now. What do you make of what's happening in the House right now? And I, I ask because it does seem that senators are sort of waiting on action from the House. The last we heard was a proposal to tie to a stopgap measure 8% cuts to non-defense programs and a series of immigration measures. Does that sound like an appropriate solution at this point to you? I I think there'll be lots of different options that are coming out there. I think there's some folks in the House that are not only worried about just where we are with $33 trillion in debt, which is a very real issue. They're also worried about immigration enforcement and trying to figure out how to be able to do that. We'll see what the final policy proposal is there. Uh, there's some things that can be done on the border, obviously, to be able to help. But it seems odd to have it in this type of format to be able to do it. But there is wide bipartisan sense that there are problems. We have 6 million people that have crossed our border 
uh, without prior authorization coming across our border just in the last three years. Uh, so that is a big issue. Obviously, our $33 trillion in debt is a big issue. Trying to be able to slam those together to be able to resolve in the next 10 days uh, gets harder. But let's at least talk about all the different issues. Do you foresee a point at which the Senate has to step in, given the unsuccessful attempts in the House to bring up that CR, a failed procedural vote on a defense appropriations rule in the House? Do, do you think the Senate needs to take a more aggressive stance in getting things moving? Right. First things first, the House has got to be able to act. If they cannot act, the Senate has to be able to act on it. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I had a conversation with another member uh, just yesterday. We we're talking about government shutdowns and the House and the Senate and how this operates. If I go back just in the past 10 years or so, almost all of the shutdowns actually originated from the House. There's one that actually originated in 2018 uh, that actually came from the Senate side, uh, shutting down the government. But most of them actually originate in the House of whatever party is there. And so it, it, th this conversation about what's the House going to do is a pretty common conversation uh, wrapped around a shutdown. So that's why this has to be a bicameral, bipartisan solution for how we're going to actually end shutdowns forever and actually keep us debating the issues that we need to debate without actually holding federal workers and all the American people hostage in the process. Well, so we can put this into a, a better context for the, the viewers and listeners who are watching on YouTube right now. I, I'm sure we'll get into the things that average everyday Americans see in, in terms of the effect of a shutdown like national parks closing. But I'm curious from a senator's perspective, what are your top concerns about what happens during a shutdown? Well, obviously, national parks is one of those issues, but that's not by far the biggest issue on this. First thing that happens is federal workers are not getting a paycheck. And many people will say, well, they will be paid in back pay. But if it's like the last shutdown that lasted, I think, 34 days, they're missing several paydays in that process. A lot of Americans still live paycheck to paycheck. And to be able to say, we'll pay you eventually is not adequate. Uh, so just the trauma that that does on federal workers. And then if I take the next step, we want to hire great people to be able to work and serve their neighbors in the federal government. It's harder to hire someone if we say to them, hey, every once in a while, we may not pay you. Is that OK? Uh, for most people, that's not OK uh, for them and for their families. So it makes it harder to hire. It makes it harder to be able to supervise and very stressful on those families. Second thing is it causes just a contagion of issues, whether it be FAA uh, and then setting aside uh, what's happening in training future air traffic controllers. That's a big issue. The reason that occurs is because we may pay federal workers, but federal contractors, now they don't get back paid. They're just not paid. So we've got contractors in all levels of the federal government. Take air traffic controllers and some of that training that's happening there. We just can't function without it. That puts us behind for years in training air traffic controllers. Uh, if you go to the southern border right now, where we have millions of people that have crossed in the last three years, just this week, we had 7,000 people a day that were illegally crossing our border. Well, the Border Patrol, it's overwhelming them. So they have contractors that work alongside them to help with transportation, help with the processing, help with getting food and all those things to be able to assist those individuals with humanitarian needs. We have a shutdown. Those contractors are off. That adds a tremendous additional workload to folks that are already overwhelmed on our border. That affects our national security. So everywhere you turn when there's a shutdown, it's not only the chaos that forms in every agency of who's essential, who's non-essential, the chaos in every family. But for a lot of those contractors and some basic functions of government, it just doesn't happen, whether it be national security or whether it be preparation for the future. These are all really big issues. So a, a shutdown is not a uh, an event that just occurs and it has no damage. It has long term damage. Do you want to see any kind of change in the approach to contractors? I, I know after the last shutdown, there's a measure enacted that guarantees back pay for federal employees, and that previously was kind of up to Congress. Uh, should there be a different approach? Should there be back pay for con contractors or any difference in how Congress addresses that? Yeah, we should address it by not having shutdowns. That's the best way to be able to address that. If you're talking about how to chase down contractors who were there and not there, some of them are on call, some of them are salary, some of them are, well, all of them are outside entities. That's very hard to be able to track and to be able to measure. That increases the cost of the federal government again into the taxpayer when you're trying to chase that down after the fact to be able to do that paperwork. So why don't we just not have shutdowns? That'd probably be the best way to be able to do it. 
Well, then let's talk about your bill that you've introduced a few times now, most recently in this Congress in January to prevent shutdowns. Uh, I, I'm sure you can explain it better, but my understanding for those who are not familiar is that this would impose an automatic continuing resolution if we were up to that shutdown deadline. But then there are a series of measures to essentially make sure that Congress doesn't just work on other things, doesn't leave town. Uh, do you have a plan to get that packaged with something? What's the plan for actually having that passed and enacted? Yeah, so let me take both those questions. Let me kind of outline what the bill is and what it's not. Uh, there have been different bills for years on how to end government shutdowns, but they've been partisan bills. They've been automatic cuts or automatic increases or the no budget, no pay that's been out there. There's been all these different bills to try to prevent government shutdowns. There's not been a nonpartisan one. So five years ago, Maggie Hassan and I sat down and said, we've got to be able to solve this. Let's work together. Let's figure out what's a nonpartisan solution. The one pressure point in Congress that's the great equalizer for everyone is time. We're all extremely busy, as all the folks that are also listening in are all extremely busy as well. We all have busy schedules and a lot of travel, both with family and official business or campaign business, whatever it may be. So our idea is pretty simple. If you don't finish your classwork during class, you have to stay after class and finish it. Uh, I say that to say, if we go all the way through the fiscal year and it's not done with the appropriations, then that means automatically a short-term continuing resolution kicks in to be able to keep government operating and functioning at the same level as the previous year. But members of Congress and our staff, the Office of Management and Budget staff, they, are, they can't travel. We're all there all the time to be able to do it. In Congress, House and Senate, we're in session seven days a week. We can't have any travel expenses to be able to travel somewhere else. And we have what's called a quorum call every day to be able to confirm that we're all here. Also, the only bills that we can move to during that time period are appropriation bills. So you can't move to other legislation. We're in seven days a week, and the only thing that we can work on is actually appropriations. That locks us in to be able to say, let's finish that appropriation work now. And then once that is finished, then we can actually kick in where we're not in session seven days a week. We can actually get back to travel. If you wanna put pressure on members of Congress, take away time. Uh, if you want to see that effect on it, come to the Senate sometime at 7 p.m. on a Thursday. And if we're still here at that time, everyone's frustrated saying, I've got campaign events, family events. I've got a CODEL. I've got official travel that I've got to get done. And everyone knows their schedule's getting blown up for the other travel that they've got to do. If we locked in and said, no one's traveling until we finish this work on appropriations, there'd be pressure on Congress to finish our work on time and to be able to get it done. And if we weren't done, I think that uh, continuing resolution would be very short because if we were here even two weeks in a row over two weekends of that travel, this place would freak out and would say, we've got to get finished on this because all the other responsibilities I've got to do are not getting done because we didn't get this done on time. So put the pressure where the pressure needs to be on members of Congress, the Office of Management and Budget, all of our staff to be able to get that work done. If we can do that, I think that's more effective in trying to be able to accomplish the work that we need to get done. Again, it's not trying to be gimmicky. It's just saying, if you haven't got your work finished, you got to stay until this gets finished and you can't move to something else until it's done. Um, your colleague, Ron Johnson, told me yesterday that he stood up at this Senate Republican conference lunch and said that he would relinquish his hold. He, he effectively delayed when there was a unanimous consent request to hold this vote on an appropriations package. Uh, he said he would allow for more speedy uh, consideration of that if he can be promised a vote on a bill to prevent shutdowns. Are you, um, are, are you making any similar uh, offers to make sure that there is a vote on this kind of bill? Yeah, we're not we're not trying to be able to pressure this. Something Maggie Hassan and I worked together on to say this is a nonpartisan bill. It wants to be nonpartisan the entire way on it. But Ron Johnson, who is obviously holding up appropriations at this point in that unanimous consent request to be able to move to it, uh, someone literally said to him during our lunch, "Hey, if we're able to move on government shutdowns, which has been a bill he's been very outspoken and supportive of my bill for years now, uh, when he was chairman of that committee." Uh, we moved it through the committee unanimously. This has been a nonpartisan bill from the beginning, but Ron's statement has been, hey, we've got to start fixing some things here in Congress. And if he has the opportunity, he said, to be able to have something else that's fixed in this process, like fixing this government shutdown mess every year, he would take that and to say, I'm glad to be able to move that. 
Uh, Maggie Hess and I, we've, we've actually put this forward. It's, we're hoping that it can be an amendment into the appropriations conversation that we have right now to be able to get a vote on this. Uh, again, just to be able to take in the next step forward. Obviously, if we pass it in this appropriations work that we're doing this week and next week, it doesn't become law right away. It becomes part of that dialogue. Then it's passed the Senate. It has to go to the House and still pass the House in that format or in a different format for them. But at least we're moving on it. This has been something for five years. We've tried to find the right vehicle, right time to be able to move it. And after the shutdown is over, everyone says, yeah, that, that's really a good bill. I'm supportive of it. We'll work on that later. And then when we get close to a shutdown, everybody starts turning around going, where's that bill that Langford and Hassan have? Let's pull that forward and try to be able to get that done. So we're at another one of those moments. And I think one of these pressure point moments like this is a time when we've got the whole country talking about it to say, let's go and vote on it. Let's actually get it up. Let's have both sides actually uh, set out there and say, let's stop doing government shutdowns. But let's actually keep the, the work going on for appropriations. And so we can get those bills done because none of us like CRs. Uh, they're they're not as bad as a shutdown, but they're not as good as getting appropriation work done. When are you offering that amendment? Is that something you want on this three bill package or what's the plan there? It is actually we've actually filed it for the three bill package. We've had it filed actually from the very beginning when this three bill package came up as a mini bus here. We filed it during that time period. It's been sitting out there pending at this point. We're asking for it to go what's called through the hotline where we have to have unanimous consent of everyone say, yes, I'll allow a vote on that. Uh, and then if it takes that point to be able to get, we can get consent among both sides to be able to get that vote, it would come up in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, if I could, before, before I know we only have a couple of minutes left, if I could play devil's advocate uh, on your bill, it, would a measure that avoids shutdowns and gives us an automatic CR, even with those restrictions that don't allow Congress to work on other things, would that paper over some more fundamental shortcomings with Congress? Uh, is there something more fundamental about Congress's inability to do appropriations bills there? Yeah, so th this has been an issue for a long time. Part This goes all the way back to the 1974 Budget Act. You, you track these issues for a long time. The 1974 Budget Act, creating this new process, it's only worked as written four times since it was written in 1974. The process itself is very broken. Uh, in the Senate, Sheldon Whitehouse, who leads the Budget Committee as chairman, he's been very outspoken on this, that we've got to make major changes in the process of how we do budgeting. If we don't change our process, we're not going to get a better product. Uh, so that's a significant shift that has to be done. This is one of those elements to change the way we do budgeting and the way we do work but we do have to change our process significantly. And and very briefly before you go, I should ask, a, a lot of the fight in the House and Senate on funding the government has cast an eye back on the debt limit bill. Uh, do you feel that, it, that there are accusations that the House is going under the caps in the debt limit deal and maybe that's not in good faith? The Senate has some emergency funds. Do you feel that everybody's still operating under the debt limit deal or are lawmakers moving away from that? I think the debt limit deal is still sitting out there as a number that everyone kind of knows is the agreed upon number. The House wants to go above it. The Senate wants to go beyond it. I'm sorry, the House wants to go below it. The Senate wants to go beyond it. Uh, so that but everyone still knows that's the agreed upon number on that we've got to be able to work towards. Again, it goes back to the most basic thing with thirty three trillion dollars in total debt. We, we have to have grown up conversations to be able to resolve this. And there's multiple different ways to do this. We can set up commissions to be able to talk through our trust funds and through what we're doing and all of our spending to make sure we're getting bipartisan, bicameral, real conversations about some of the issues. We could talk about discretionary spending and appropriation bills. There are ways to be able to address this, but we've got to get a holistic look to say, how do we get back on balance? If I go back to the late 90s, we were we were doing balanced budget work during that time period. Now, 25 years later, we're not close anymore. We're $2 trillion in the red in a single year. That's more than we were spending in the late 90s total. We're doing in deficit numbers 25 years later. Uh, so it, it is time for a grown-up conversation, but it can't happen all at once, and it can't happen in a moment like this. It has to be a moment where people have time to be able to think, process, plan, and to be able to look at the big picture. All right, Senator Langford, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through uh, all of these issues. Clearly a, a very timely conversation. Really appreciate you taking the time. You bet. Glad to do it. Glad for people's engagement on this. This is not intended to be partisan, and it's not intended to do anything other than say, let's protect us from shutdowns. It doesn't have any other trick features. It just takes that off the table.
All right. Thank you again. Uh, I will move on now to our next panel, including Margaret Weikert and Michael Linden. Really a, a great time to have these two people on. Margaret Weikert was Deputy Director for Management at the White House Office of Management and Budget uh, during the Trump White House from uh, 2018 to 2020, as well as serving as Acting Director for the Office of Personnel Management. Uh, and Michael Linden worked in the Biden Administration Office of Management and Budget until pretty recently. He was there uh, at the beginning of 2021 until June of this year as senior advisor and executive associate director. Uh, thank you both so much for, for joining us on this discussion, uh, again, at a time when any discussion of shutdowns is sort of geared toward the next 10 days as Congress tries to find a, a funding deal. Um, Margaret, I, I'd like to start with you, given that you worked at OMB during the last shutdown that we had, which turned out to be the longest shutdown, the 34-day lapse in appropriations. Can you walk us through basically what is going on at OMB in the lead up to a shutdown deadline? I would imagine there's a lot of preparation that needs to happen. What's the mood and what it, what are the tasks at hand for the White House Office of Management and Budget at a time like this? So uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, that was a particularly uh, tricky time uh, that we went through those 34 days. But every year I was at OMB, the same thing nearly happened or um, had elements of the trip wire of shutdown happening. And basically the trip wire in OMB is when you're uh, a number of days out from an event that could lead to a shutdown, OMB has to issue a range of communications to all federal agencies providing guidance on what's going to happen. And so even if a shutdown doesn't occur, there are a lot of communications, daily phone calls that um, start to take place to alert federal agencies about what is going to happen. And the senator alluded to um, some of the complexities of how government is funded. Not everyone is funded directly through appropriations. So you may have in agencies a set of people funded by appropriations, a set of people like at OPM who are funded through trust fund money or fee revenue who may be affected differently. And the agencies each need time to sort through how all their people are going to be affected, how all their activities, their programs are going to be affected. And in different administrations, the main difference um, that, that comes up is how the legal interpretation of the Anti-Deficiency Act plays out. And so the big thing that happens at OMB is lots of lawyers weighing in on what activities are actually exempt, what are accepted activities, and what are the legal ramifications of you know, how you handle that. So that's kind of the run up. So it, it clearly, uh, a lot of legal questions, I, I, I imagined that. Um, before we move on, I should note for our uh, viewers, please, you can submit questions. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can submit questions via the live chat on YouTube. You can also post them on X, formerly known as Twitter, using the hashtag BPC Live. BPC is in Bipartisan Policy Center, hashtag BPC Live. And I will make sure uh, to get in some of your questions, at least at the end. If anybody submits questions that are better than my own, I won't hold it against you and I'll, I'll work them into the top of it. Um, and we will, we've will we got until uh, 1245. So if you get your questions in, I'll make sure to, to get some of our listeners' questions in using the hashtag BPC Live. Uh, Michael, I, I especially am interested uh, in your perspective, having recently been at the Biden administration at OMB, uh, just you, I understand you left at June, um, it, especially given the way the debt limit conversation went, some of the tough votes in the House, we know that the Republicans have a very narrow majority. Has the Biden administration prepared for the likelihood of a shutdown? Have there been conversations uh, about the, the likelihood of getting into a scenario like we are now where it's just not clear where the votes are in Congress to fund the government? Yeah. 
So let me step back for a minute and just say, I think we can all agree. I, I heard Senator Langford say it, Senator Hassan say it, and I think we can all agree that shutdowns are bad. <laughs> they should be avoided. We want a uh, government that works on behalf of the people. We want government that is doing the people's business and appropriations are part of that. And so I really applaud the effort to put shutdowns behind us. The problem that we have right now in this particular situation is that there is a small group, a minority really, of House Republicans, just, just House, just Republicans, who are making very extreme demands that are outside of the boundaries of the debt limit agreement that I was part of in negotiating. I was in the room with the speaker's team. Uh, I was staffing Shalanda Young, the director of the Office of Management and Budget. I was literally in the room when these conversations were happening, a part of those negotiations. I know that there is a bipartisan agreement on top line levels and a path forward. And there was 300 something votes in, this, in the House for that debt limit agreement. Uh, the Senate has been passing uh, bipartisan appropriations bills out of committee uh, that are roughly in line with the debt limit negotiation that in the Fiscal Responsibility Act that came out of that. So the problem here in this particular situation, and there's always different permutations, but right now we have a small group of House Republicans who are basically making very extreme demands, cutting you know Title I by 80 percent or cutting WIC, uh, you know, which is uh, nutrition assistance for for pregnant women, um, way, way, way lower than the top line levels that that we had agreed to. Um, they are demanding that they get votes on those things or else they're going to shut down the government. There are the votes. You, to your question, there are the votes in Congress for uh, a reasonable CR if we have to do that uh, at the current levels. It just has to be a bipartisan vote. And there definitely is a bipartisan majority in both the House and the Senate for that. The question is whether the House will put that up for a vote. Well, Michael, I'm, I'm curious, uh, especially given Senator Langford's comments uh, that kind of indicated that the, the debt limit measure is sort of a middle ground. You've got the House appropriators who put out appropriations bills below those spending caps. The Senate did have some emergency money that they uh, used to go a, a little bit over the caps. Uh, you are correct to point out the Partisan issues are certainly in the House. In the Senate, the bills that have some extra money uh, were reported out of the Appropriations Committee unanimously. I think that the most number of votes against one was, I believe, 25 to 4. Um, more money may mean more bipartisanship. It, do, but do you do you think that that debt limit negotiation actually held or do you see the two sides branching off and do you do you think it still represents a viable middle ground at this point i mean it was certainly a compromise that's that was the nature of the of the agreement was a bipartisan compromise something that could get 150 republican votes in the house and at least 70 democratic votes we ended up getting a lot more than that in the house uh, and that could pass the Senate on a bipartisan basis, and and that's what we what we got. I think it's interesting in this this conversation is really timely, right? Because I think it reveals something about shutdowns and shutdown threats. In this particular situation, we had a bipartisan top line agreement. We had it months ahead of the deadline for appropriations bills, and yet we are still in this conversation about well, are we going to shut down the government? And that is in this case because. The House leadership is ceding authority to a small rump group of quite extreme members. There is a bipartisan majority in the House. It would require 150 Republicans and 70 Democrats or 150 Democrats, but it's there. It's just a question whether the speaker is going to put that on the floor. And I get he's got very complicated internal politics. You know, I, I was witness to that in the room and I don't um, I don't uh, you know, I don't envy him, and I think that's going to be a challenging road to, 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 to chart. But look, if you put a clean CR uh, on the floor today in the House and let anybody vote for it who, they want, who, they want, who wants to, it would pass with a bipartisan majority. Now, does that solve the underlying problem that Senator Lankford and Senator Hassan are trying to solve? No, it solves today's problem. Uh, but it is, it, this today's problem is really the product of this 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 uh, extreme caucus in the house uh margaret i, I especially want to ask you as i mentioned you were there uh in the trump administration during the last shutdown and I, i'm curious if this 
sort of rhymes with the lead up to any previous shutdowns. I've, I've done a little uh, work reminding myself of what the mood was in Washington in 2018. Uh, do you, I, I should ask the, the simple question, Margaret, do you expect a shutdown based on what you're hearing uh, and, and the way things are working out in DC? And if it's really looking bad, what do you attribute that to, Margaret? So I uh, no longer try to handicap these things because, um, you know, I was I was wrong pretty much every time while I was in government. Um, and, um, you know, for for sure, I didn't think the uh, 2018 shutdown was going to last 34 days. I, I really didn't um, think that because there was such a big and sort of profound impact on both the American people of that shutdown, as well as uh, in, you know, federal employees. It, it was really troubling when I was sitting at OPM in particular, watching you know, news footage of federal employees needing to receive food assistance themselves because they were missing paychecks around the holidays. Um, so I won't handicap that. What, what I will say, and it's kind of interesting, I've been, um, Going back to the beginning of, you know, rereading the Constitution and the Federalist Papers and uh, thinking about even where the Anti-Deficiency Act momentum came from, it's a fundamental challenge between Article I and Article II of our Constitution, that, you know, tug of war between the executive branch and Congress, as well as Many of the things that are peculiar to the United States government and particularly how we fund things relate to the idea that in a large, diverse republic like ours, you cannot just have tyranny of the majority. You can't have a you know, one size fits all, 51% rules the day. There are so many elements in our government that are purpose built to give minorities the ability to influence the direction of our polity. And, you know, to me that the, the sort of sanguine view on all of this is this is our unique form of Republican democracy, small r, at work. It does give power to minorities in a way that is, is not present in other kinds of democracies. Um, completely agree with Senator uh, Langford and, and uh, Michael about, you know, the shutdown piece of this is bad. It's bad for the economy, for our people and for employees um, and avoiding it would be good. But I don't think it's an inherent, um, you know, negative or, or just um, uh, a, a terrible thing. I think it does voice uh, the opinion of of some people who want to be heard. Well, I, I, you mentioned something really interesting, uh, which is the uh, the tension between different laws that play into what happens uh, regarding government funding and what happens during a shutdown. Uh, the Anti-Deficiency Act. I'm sure we could spend the whole rest of the time talking about the ins and outs of the Anti-Deficiency Act. Uh, the, the short version for anybody watching who doesn't know is that the Anti-Deficiency Act is the law that essentially says that the executive branch cannot spend money that has not been appropriated by Congress. It's the, the limitation on expenditures that are not uh, legal through congressional appropriations bills. Now, it, it gets way more complicated than that. I did want to ask you, Margaret, especially looking back to the last shutdown and the many conversations that have happened in the last decade about what is what is and isn't supposed to happen during a shutdown. Um, there were a few interest, interesting and, and controversial examples of things that weren't fully closed during the 2018 to 19 shutdown. There were some national parks that were open. Uh, the GAO put out something later saying that the actions were not legal uh, with regard to the Anti-Deficiency Act and some things more specific toward national parks. There was a very high profile uh, announcement by your former boss, Russell Vogt, who was the acting OMB director at the time, who uh, brought back in IRS employees in order to prepare for tax filing uh, ahead of uh, tax season. Do you look back and see 
anything that the Trump administration did wrong uh, with those examples or any others with regard to keeping things open, keeping some things functioning during a shutdown? So I think, you know, what all of this conversation is highlighting is that this activity is inherently a political activity of whether Congress funds various things and also how the executive branch responds, um, depending on who kind of was uh, calling the question or kind of tripping the wire, there's a political dimension to that. And in the Trump administration, uh, you may have heard the term Schumer shutdown. Um, that was one of the things uh, Senator Langford uh, um, alluded to that that the tripwire really happened in the set Senate at that time. I think the key thing was a lot of the laws around spending and this body of law are, you know, they're, they're somewhat vague. What is accepted activity? What is essential activity? If you've only had a handful of shutdowns, you don't have a ton of case law actually explicitly saying, this is okay, this is not okay. The big difference with the ADA law is that individual um, uh, employees could in fact be liable and go to jail for violating the act. And so some administrations have been very conservative and basically said, you know, if, if it isn't explicitly allowed or it hasn't explicitly been done before, we won't do that. The Trump administration really lawyered up on this and wanted to go line by line. I mean, we weren't we weren't taking any breaks at OMB during that time. We were, you know, my it's not my favorite example, but a really great example was the lights on the Christmas tree on the National Mall went out. And a super complicated set of things, you know, national parks are involved, general services administration is involved. You know, who are the electricians? Well, they're actually a contractor um, to turn the lights back on. And the administration decided it was important enough to really look granularly at that because they felt that for the American people, it was really important to keep this symbol alive and alight. Um, and so I, I personally think that was a good approach. It's, it's a hard approach because you basically have to look at the legal merits of each and everything you want to keep open. Um, but I think it was, um, you know, a, a, particularly since the shutdown lasted so long, important to do so that you didn't have kind of a cascade of problems happening. Um, and obviously the Christmas tree is not nearly, you know, in the top um, category of importance. Mm -hmm. Michael, do you see the uh, the Biden administration doing things differently with regard to the Anti-Deficiency Act and what exactly happens if there is a shutdown? Yeah, I, look, I think that the um, mindful not to, to spend all of our time on the Anti-Deficiency Act, but since Margaret and I both worked at OMB, it was it was a, a big topic of conversation. And I think it's important to step back and, and say the, the principle behind the, the Anti-Deficiency Act is really makes a lot of sense and is really universal. We do not want the executive branch spending money or entering into obligations that Congress has not authorized. Congress has the power of the purse, not the executive branch. And that is, you know, when I was there, and I'm sure this is true for Margaret too, OMB took that very seriously. We spent a lot of time making sure that we were in compliance with that law because the underlying principle is so important. Congress decides where to spend the money and then the executive branch goes out and does that. And so the basic principle is very, very important. And when you get into a shutdown scenario, you are faced with these kinds of impossible choices where Congress has not given you the money to do the thing. The thing is, there's no money for it, but is it, does it going to cost somebody their life, their livelihood? Is it going to make a major uh, disruption in, in a community's you know, plans or in, is it going to cause harm, d very damaging harm and uh, irre irreplaceable harm? Those are 
tough questions and sometimes it's in, in the eye of the beholder and an administration can choose to take a very broad view of that and try to make the shutdown as painless as possible. An administration can take the letter of the law and say, look, we don't have the money, we can't, we can't do it. I think the key here is that we should avoid shutdowns and people should not be threatening shutdowns and putting the administration in that position to make those kinds of decisions. We don't want that. We want a continuing resolution. For some amount of time, we want regular appropriations bills. And the threat of a shutdown is really, in my view, outside the boundaries of uh, a fair negotiation, right? Because, because of these, these kinds of things, really, uh, they put the administration in impossible positions that we don't want to put anybody in. So can you point to anything in particular that you think the Biden administration would approach differently in a shutdown compared to the Trump administration? Look, I can't speak to the decisions that they're making right now. I, I can absolutely uh, confirm what Margaret was saying earlier that, you know, we spend when I was there, we didn't have a shutdown in the two and a half years that I was there. But as we got closer to appropriations deadlines, we did start going through those same processes that Margaret mentioned. You know, we we review agency shutdown plans. We talk about when agencies need to decide who's uh, essential and who's not essential. Uh, those things do happen and did happen. I can't speak to what the Biden administration is thinking now. I what I I'm pretty sure they're thinking is we should not have a shutdown. Pass a CR for at least a little bit of time at current levels. It's going to get bipartisan support. There's no reason to have a shutdown right now. If we need more time to finish the appropriations bills, that's fine. That's happened before. It happens all the time. As somebody mentioned earlier, it almost never happens on time. So give yourself more time. But a shutdown is is terrible and we shouldn't do it. Um, Margaret, I, I want to make sure we understand some of the scope of the shutdown threat now and what would happen, not as differences between the Trump and Biden administration, but the fact that looking back to the 2018 to 19 shutdown, uh, which I think is sort of a, a, some people's guidepost, some major appropriations bills were enacted into law, and that was actually a partial government shutdown for those 34 days. The, de the uh, defense appropriations okay. bill was enacted. Um, can you describe to us, if we do see a shutdown in 11 days, uh, given that there are no enacted appropriations bills, how does this contrast in scope with the 2018 to 19 example that a lot of people might be looking back to? Yeah, so I think that is a big difference um, when you actually look, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, of the number of federal employees who were actually affected in that shutdown, it was something like 40% of federal employees. And because the Defense Department is the largest employer of federal employees, the fact that the defense spending bill had been passed essentially meant that DOD activities continued um, and a lot of challenges that would have been faced otherwise, um, you know, were averted by that spending bill. I mean, basically, it, it's not just the federal employees. It's also, you know, grants can be affected depending on the legal elements associated with them. Um, contractors, you know, a huge amount of the technology that we depend on not only to do new things for, for the federal government, but also to keep secure and, you know, manage information security and prevent hacking, that's done by contractors and that can be affected very differently. And so I would say every aspect of government, um, could be affected if we don't end up with some form of a continuing resolution. I do think historically Congress has been pretty good about some of those really sort of mission critical things, realizing how those will be affected. You know, the Department of Veterans Affairs, um, healthcare for our, you know, uh, wonderful veterans could be affected you know, and depending on, you know, what um, the actual legal situation is, probably most routine care would get pushed off as opposed to, you know, urgent care and things of that nature. 
Well, it, your mention of grants, that is, some of which can go out, it makes me wonder how long we have in the case of a shutdown. I recall examples a couple weeks into the last shutdown in which agencies and grants that were not initially affected were affected because they had been relying on revenue and, and that kind of thing. And of course, there have been examples um, the, the January 2018 brief shutdown was largely over a, a long weekend. So I, my big picture question, Margaret, is if there is a shutdown, how long do we have until it gets really, really bad? Uh, because I understand it's not just one deadline. There's almost a rolling series of deadlines, right? Yeah, and and I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand and is very mysterious to people is there are many parts of the government, you know, I'll just mention uh, Office of Personnel Management um, has three forms of funding. Um, it has funding that comes from other agencies in the form of fees, and that funding isn't directly affected by um, the appropriations bills. There's also the big trust funds for you know, the federal employees' health care and federal employees' retirement, people who are paid out of that bucket of money aren't affected directly. But there are a lot of things where if one agency is paying another agency, there could be money that could be spent for a period of time. But once that money is spent down and there's no more money in that bucket, then employees will be affected. And this is where it gets super complicated uh, we use the term color of money that really talks about, you know, how things are paid for and the legal definitions around how things are paid for really affect what can be spent. So the, the question you asked about time is a total, it depends. You know, if it's three days, it's rare that it's going to have a major impact. It's not going to affect payroll that much. Um, you know, there might be a day or two where people are affected. If it goes two weeks, it starts affecting people's paychecks. If it goes longer than two weeks, it really starts affecting all kinds of things with these kind of trickle down impacts. Right. Michael, I should mention October 1st this year is a Sunday. Um, can you walk us through similarly how you would expect the early stages of a shutdown, what would the immediate effects be? Is there any uh, sense that if, if they can keep it a short shutdown, it, it maybe not, it, it won't be quite as bad as if we have another 34 day shutdown? What do you see as the uh, effects of a shutdown schedule depending on the length of a shutdown? Yeah, look, the shorthand here, the short answer, the rule of thumb is the longer the shutdown goes, the much worse it is always. That's always going to be the case. And a very, very short shutdown, 24 hours, to Margaret's point, it's unlikely to have dramatic effects, although it's still going to be very painful for the people, you know, my former colleagues uh, trying to make manage that all work. I, I feel for them. Um, and we shouldn't minimize a short shutdown. There's no reason to have it if you can, if if you were able to get a deal done in 24 hours, that means you probably could have done it 24 hours earlier. So um, a short shutdown is not going to be uh, too damaging, but a very long, the longer it goes, it becomes very, very difficult. Those choices become very difficult. There is money um, from, for example, appropriated entitlements that begins to run out. That's like the food stamp program. Food stamps unlikely to be affected in the near term over long term, very likely to be affected. But I think we should really step back and, and think a little bit about, OK, we all agree shutdowns bad, very bad. We should avoid them. There's no reason for a shutdown right now. Totally understand that. I think the question a little bit is, well, is this auto continuing resolution proposal, you know, the appropriate response to the shutdowns that that we have been seeing these threat shutdown threats? And, you know, I, just from my own perspective, I wanted to say, like, I appreciate what Senator Lankford and Senator Hassan are doing or trying to do with this legislation. And I think their hearts are in the right place. I do think it's important to note that there are some real problems with uh, an automatic CR approach that I think should be taken into account if it's being considered seriously. For one thing, even in a short CR, there are things that don't really work well under quote unquote current levels. 
the, in, in OMB speak, we call those anomalies, right? We call them things that they're sort of things that you need to make small adjustments to, even in a CR, even in a short CR. And this legislation doesn't have any accommodation for that. And that would be a real challenge for a lot of agencies. And I would really love to see the legislation in, in, uh, incorporate some mechanism for incorporating anomalies. Uh, that's one concern that I have. I also do appreciate very much that the legislation tries to envision a way to ensure that Congress doesn't just live under continuing resolutions forever. That was a problem with some earlier iterations of this kind of proposal, where if we're just going to do auto CRs, maybe there's no incentive to ever come to an agreement. And the truth is, appropriations do need to happen on an annual basis. Things change year to year. Government should change its priorities and investigate those priorities on a year to year basis, especially with appropriations. And so, you know, forever continuing resolutions is is not great either. And so I do appreciate this legislation envisions some attempts to really force Congress to deal with the appropriations process. I'm skeptical, I have to say it, that, you know, travel restrictions alone will do that. That makes me somewhat nervous. I, yeah, I wanted to ask both of you your thoughts on the realism or, or, or any drawbacks of this bill. Margaret, what do you, what do you, what's your reaction to uh, Senator Lankford's bill? Do you see any drawbacks, any tweaks that you think should be made? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that bill? I, first of all, I would say starting somewhere that is not where we are today is great. Um, I do think travel is a, a major consideration. I am absolutely confident we would not have had a 34 day shutdown if the people in Congress had to stay over the Christmas break the way the people at OMB had to stay. Um, it was, uh, you know, very easy to kind of forget about um, what was going on until. You know, I thought maybe they'd solve it, you know, the 6th of January or something like that. It took a little bit longer. But if they had been stuck in Washington, I'm guessing, you know, everybody who wanted to be home for Christmas would have, you know, made a priority of getting that all resolved before the 25th of, of December. Um, you know, I think there could be um, other things you could do. I do see the the challenges of, you know, just a continuing resolution posture that doesn't actually force Congress into looking at hard trade-offs. I mean, part of where the debt thing, um, you know, always makes me chuckle is it's Congress who authorized the spending that put us into debt. And so really the, you know, they're they're holding the executive branch hostage, but the place where there needs to be the discussion, the grown up conversations that Senator Langford talked about is in Congress. And, and I do think, you know, as long as there's a way to continue to have those conversations, um, this is a really good start. Do you see, Margaret, the the current situation lending itself to a path to enacting that. I, I'm especially thinking of 2019 after the last shutdown. Uh, Tim Kaine objected to a motion to to uh, adjourn, I believe, and kind of used that as a demand to guarantee back pay for federal employees. Given how bad things look, uh, is there enough of a sense of desperation here so that you think that there could be some momentum for this kind of bill or something process focused? Um. Well, there's that great adage about, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, so I think all of the political actors involved are going to be thinking about how do we take this moment in time and, and move forward the activities that we want. Um, you know, the past is somewhat prelude, but as I mentioned earlier, in a political realm, Political actors are going to make use of whatever the specifics are, not the general philosophy of what is the you know long term right answer. And so I don't know that we can prevent political actors from behaving politically, but I do hope that some of the the players who have have seen this movie before 
um, and and been given pause about it, um, take some lessons from that. Um, I, I think we've somewhat preemptively answered a, a couple questions that came in from our viewers, uh, but there's one that we haven't really touched on. Michael, uh, the question we got is, all of this talk about shutdowns revolves around spending cuts. Will policymakers put revenue increases on the table as a way to address our fiscal challenges? How would you answer that, Michael? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, look, stepping back for a moment and thinking big picture, you know, there are long term fiscal pressures uh, and we do need to manage our long term fiscal risks, uh, whether that's an immediate problem or a top 10 crisis for the moment is a debate that I think people can have. But I think we can agree that there are some fiscal pressures. The question is whether this uh, process, the appropriations process, is the appropriate place to manage those big fiscal risks. I mean, ultimately, discretionary spending, appropriation spending, is actually a very small part part of overall federal spending. And to the question, or to the very good question, the debt is actually a product of a mismatch between spending and revenue. We have spent the last 20 years cutting taxes, uh, primarily skewed to the people at the top of the income spectrum and to corporations. And if you look back and you actually say, why is the debt and the deficit today higher than what we expected it to be 20 years ago, 20 years ago when we did have balanced budgets, as Senator Lankford mentioned, and you look projections forward, why are things less balanced now than we thought they were going to be? The culprit is entirely tax cuts. Uh, for, uh, for again, primarily for people at the top. So yes, I think revenue does need to be part of that long-term fiscal conversation, but that this moment is really about appropriations, which is not primarily the driver of deficit and debt or spending. That's not really the issue. The issue here is we had an agreement on top line levels. All that really needs to happen here is that the appropriations committee, I mean, honestly, what needs to happen here is the House needs to follow the bipartisan lead of the Senate and pass bills that are in line with the agreement that they already voted for. Uh, and if they can't do that right now, then they just need to pass a continuing resolution at current levels and give themselves more time. I don't think that this is the appropriate moment for a broader conversation about deficit and debt. But when that moment comes, I absolutely think revenue is the key issue. It is the single biggest driver of why our fiscal situation is more risky today than it would, was expected to be 20 years ago. We just got one other question that I want to sneak in right before we close. Speaking of uh, the small nature of discretionary funds compared to mandatory, uh, the question is, while government directives make clear that claims for Medicare benefits continue to be paid during a shutdown, would that still be the case if a shutdown lasted for months? Uh, Margaret, can you give us a quick answer on Medicare payments and if and when they're affected? Uh, the very quick answer is it depends. And it relates to that color of money. If there were sources of funding that had been appropriated previously, um, it, it could continue to work. I don't think we'd ever get to the point, though, where we'd exhaust that because that would be the crisis. Um, anything affecting Social Security or Medicare would be the crisis, I think, that politically would make a shutdown uh, non-feasible. Um, and it would end. But I think it's an excellent question, um, one that I'm going to give some more thought to. All right. Well, Michael, yes, Michael. I was just going to say, you know, Medicare and Social Security are both mandatory spending. They're permanent appropriations. They're not uh, appropriated entitlements. Medicaid is an appropriated entitlement, which so Medicaid would eventually be affected. Medicare benefits and Social Security benefits in theory, would not be affected by a shutdown, except, as Margaret says, the administration of those benefits, uh, Social Security Administration, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they run on discretionary, on appropriated funding. The, so pe the, people, the people who do yeah, the work. Exactly. The people whose job it is to make sure those things get to their intended recipients, those people are funded by discretionary spending. So the benefits themselves would not be di directly affected by the, the shutdown, but the administration of those benefits certainly could be. Uh, very good point to end on, uh, given the focus on our, our discussion on what happens 
if it's a long shutdown, what happens if it's a short shutdown? Uh, I'm sure many, many people in Washington are crossing their fingers for no shutdown, or at least if, if things really have to go crazy, a very short shutdown. Uh, really great insights from, uh, from both of you. Thank you again, Margaret Weikert and Michael Linden. Uh, and thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center for putting this discussion on. Thanks again to uh, Senator James Langford for joining us earlier and Senator Maggie Hassan for the message at the beginning of this program. I'm Jack Fitzpatrick from Bloomberg Government. Really appreciate everybody involved in this discussion. Uh, and thank you all for watching. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.